Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another Smoke on Go aviation conversation with Nigel Lamb from uh, England. Nigel is a man of many talents from uh, flying warbirds, anything from a pit special to an extra 300, uh, aerobatic pilot, formation aerobatic pilot, world champion, Red Bull racer. Today, we are going to learn all about him. Welcome, Nigel. Oh, it's great to be here. Good to see all you guys. Brought Scully along just to complement the uh, conversation. As a kid, I remember Scully always running ideas by you. When, when he started something, he was, I need to speak to Nigel, I need to get his advice. Well, I mean, it's, it's been my pleasure. I, I had uh, known about Scully and I was delighted to get a letter from you, Scully, I think 1984, I think, just I before think. you started the first pit special aerobatic team. And that was a, a very funny uh, story because Scully was asking advice on, you know, here we are, we're ex-military guys, want to start a team, what advice would you give? You you were ex-military and you're now in a team. You know, what would you say? And I, I wrote a letter back and Scully told me many years later, he said, you know, when I got that letter from you, um, I just thought, no, nah, man, this, this can't be right. And, and he says, and we then took our path set up the team and on that journey I realized that if anybody ever writes a letter to me asking the advice I asked you I would write back the same letter you sent to me and it was basically keep it simple do it well start off very very simple and just do it really really well for those people that don't know Nigel's originally from Rhodesia Zimbabwe as we know it now Scully's from South Africa my grandfather your dad Scully's dad were both RAF pilots it's something that you share something I'm very proud of very proud of my grandfather if you could just tell us a little bit more about your dad yeah my my dad was born in uh, Newcastle in uh, up north and he turned 18 a month before the Germans uh, invaded uh, Poland and he immediately uh, signed on in the RAF and he, all through the Battle of Britain year 1940, he was training in the UK, left in 1948 to, in pursuit of a farming job in, in just south of Salisbury, which is now Harare. And uh, by the time I was born, he was uh, managing a couple of thousand acres of, of timber and cattle in the Eastern Highlands, so far divorced from flying. Around about 1938, 1939, my dad was a medical student uh, at, the, at the University of Advertis Rond, and they weren't allowed to sign up. Medical students weren't allowed to, uh, to, to go into any of the services because the feeling was that they were going to be needed uh, as soon as they had qualified as doctors. So my dad went across the border, across the Limpopo River. He got a mining ticket or, and... Uh, uh, he arrived uh, in Bulawayo uh, as, a, as a learner miner, but uh, joined the Royal Air Force, learned to fly there on tiger moths, then went to Guelo, uh, which is known as Gueru today, where he, he did his multi-engine training. And then he was sent to uh, Burma, India and Burma. And he flew there out over the jungles doing uh, supply dropping. And uh, from there... Uh, went to England, and that is where they trained for the D-Day invasion and the crossing of the Rhine eventually. So he was a, a transport pilot, towing gliders and doing casualty evacuations, etc., etc. But he fired my imagination. I looked at all of his scrapbooks and his photo albums, and that was it. I was going to fly. That's quite fascinating, and for me, it's, it's quite an interesting link because Guelo is where I learned to fly. So I did my first solo on Piston Provost at Guelo, maybe 20, 25 years after your father. And um, my father's story is very interesting because he was 22 years old during D-Day, and... Um, uh, in the following month, so July 44, he moved from a flight commander on 19 squadron, which was a Mustang squadron, across to, to become the boss of 65 squadron. 
uh, and not long after that, they actually moved over to their, his first basing in Europe was in Bayer in Normandy. So once the Normandy invasions had taken place and they established the beachheads, and then he moved up to near Brussels. And then in September 1944, he was actually shot down 10 days before the Bridge to Far story. And then he moved to Africa. And uh, my story is very unlike yours because I've just been really enjoying punching holes in the sky. And your upbringing and your introduction to flying through your father was so aviation uh, linked. I mean, you were around, you had the airplane in your backyard, your old man was there the whole time, and he was enthusing you to fly, which you then did with Ellis. Whereas my father said nothing about the war. He didn't say a thing, but the house was full of books. And if you asked him, he might tell an anecdote. But all of the stuff I've just told you about, I found out through his, with his logbook, and through after I got to the UK. My father was rescued by a Dutch policeman who uh, wrote a four-page uh, document with exactly what happened. So he's, he's standing on the edge of the Vaal with a bunch of uh, German staff officers watching the battle, and then they see an airplane on flames pulling up with a pilot parachuting, and the Dutch policeman was a member of the underground and he was on a motorbike. So he got to the village, which is a little village called Vincent. And he got there before the Germans did. By the time he got there, my father was in civilian clothes. His parachute had been hidden. <laughs> and he put my father on the back of his motorbike and drove back the way the Germans were coming and took him to a doctor. And all of the stuff was documented. So we had names, uh, not necessarily very accurate addresses, but we had a lot to go on. So my brother and I went down this path and after two days, we just came to dead end after dead end. And eventually the, a police woman gave us a little lead. And uh, she said, you know, there's a, there's a fellow in Vincent who has a private museum. So we dropped in. And as I was parking the car, my brother knocked on his door. Excuse me, we're from England. Sorry to disturb you. We just wondered, our father was, and before he even finished the sentence, the fellow said, yeah, his airplane crashed behind those trees just over there in that orchard, and his parachute came down over there. So it was fat, and he had this amazing museum in his house. And we met a nearly 90-year-old lady who was 12, I think, and she recalled her father shouting, duck, as the, the empty P-51 Mustang came down into their orchard. Obviously, all those books inspired you to fly, and you're on a farm in uh, in Zimbabwe, and high school's finished. Did you go straight into the military? You know, I was a very, very underconfident, middle of the roader at school, okay at academics, very average at sport. Watching people who were really good at stuff, people I looked at really good at sport, very smart, you know, doing A levels, whatever none of them getting into the Air Force, applying and not getting in. By, by the time I was instructing and the, gov the, the, the changeover happened in uh, Rhodesia, it was now Zimbabwe, we were allowed to terminate our contracts. I'd just been completely turned on by the idea of barnstorming kind of flying by Richard Bach's book. Do you know Richard Bach, the author? Yeah. Yeah. He wrote Jonathan Living Seagull. Yeah. He wrote A Gift of Wings. Yes. A Gift of Wings blew my mind. The idea of an open cockpit, no radio, no air traffic control, landing it in a field. <laughs> <laughs> no, no wind sock, you know, finding the wind direction, looking for the wind on the, you know, all that kind of stuff. Just, I really, really fancied that. So I then was reading an old flight magazine and I saw an advert from 1979 looking for pilots for 1980. So I wrote a letter sent it to my uncle who lived in England, said, please call this number, get the address and post this letter, which he did. And I got a refusal from Philip Neeson saying, you're too young, too inexperienced. I phoned Philip Neeson and tried to persuade him on the phone. 
And at the end of it, he said, I still think you're too young, you're too inexperienced. It's, it's wonderful that you're so enthusiastic. If ever you're passing through England, give me a call and perhaps we can go flying together in a pit special. It's a long story, but it took me 10 days to persuade Philip Meeson to give me a job. And it was, it was an amazing three weeks I spent here in England. He had me flying all over the place. Go, can you go and fetch some spare parts here? Can you drop this off? And I was flying around England. Luckily, I had done a PPL. So I had a Zimbabwe PPL on a Piper Cup. In those days, any PPL from pretty much most countries allowed you to fly a G-registered airplane for private purposes as long as you had the owner's permission. So I was perfectly authorized. And he just had me flying this pits around England. It was brilliant. Scully sent me solo on the pits after a, after a military career and already quite a bit of airline flying. And uh, I still remember it like it was yesterday. It's quite a challenge. It's great if you can get a lot of landings. I seem to think I had a dry mouth at the time, and Scully said, another hundred landings, and then you'll finally get rid of the dry mouth. How did you and Scully get to know each other? How did you, where, where was the initial contact or connection? I had heard about Nigel Lamb, Nigel Lamb, Nigel Lamb, and you had become almost a household name. That's when I wrote to you and told you that I was about to start a team. Uh, how did I start our team? Well, uh, we used to go to America. They used to fly us out to America to do simulator training on the, the Boeing 727 in Denver, Colorado. And from there, I would, uh, was quite adventurous. I would go out to all sorts of places uh, in America. And I happened to get to the Dayton Air Fair. And at the Dayton Airfair, there was a team called the Ray-Ban Golds. They had uh, Pitts S2Ss before the advent of the S2B. And they flew at the Dayton Airfair. That's where the United States Air Force Museum is. And I had never seen anything as beautiful in my life before, particularly with the sound that emanated from those six-cylinder engines. And I decided there and then, this is what I want. And I pursued the dream of, a, of an aerobatic team with a single-mindedness of purpose. Eventually, I ended up landing on top of a truck with a Piper Cub. That went out on television. From that point onwards, instead of having all the resumes and the motivations, which I typed out with photographs, instead of having them thrown into the dustbin by the secretary, not even the boss, uh, I, I would go in and say, I'm the guy that lands on top of the truck. It brought you some credibility. And eventually they said, oh, come in and sit down and tell us all about this. And I said, yes, I land on top of a truck and this is what I do. But this is what I really want to do. I want to start this aerobatic team. And uh, luckily there was a cigarette company that said that they would sponsor this aerobatic team. That's when I got on to you. I was very lucky because I came in and, and, and got into the Marlboro aerobatic team with Philip Meeson, who was a an extraordinary mentor for me. And we're, we're still very, very good friends. I joined the team. I then ended up doing a lot of the management stuff for Philip because he was an entrepreneur. He had lots of different businesses. And then I became a partner in the team in 1985. I, I bought into the team. I bought a Pitts S1S to then lease to the team. And then in 1986, got involved in competition, started competition aerobatic flying. I was a partner. And then at the end of 87, I bought the team from Philip. But we didn't have much longer with Marlborough because cigarette advertising was becoming very, very difficult as a sponsor. Of, you know, we were becoming a difficult platform for the cigarette advertising industry. And, uh, and, and that, that traipsing the round with a briefcase and a, and, a, and a presentation trying to get sponsorship is so hard. So once Marlborough came to an end, your next step was Toyota. Am I correct in saying that? <laughs> Toyota UK for a couple of years. And then they said, look, we, we really need to diversify more and spread our budget more. So uh, how do you guys feel about Europe? So we were, of course, very enthusiastic about Europe. So we ended up 
where UK, Toyota UK, Belgium and Holland were all putting into the pot and we ended up spreading our wings a little bit. Sometimes we would do on a long weekend, you'd certainly do 12 or 15 displays every year, you know, a thousand displays just in the UK. To go to, to Europe was, fan, was fantastic for us. I'd done it full time for 13 years and I wanted a sabbatical. I really, really, we just had our first uh, child and I said to my wife, Hillary, I said, you know, honestly, I, I, I just want to break. I just want to do something different for a year. So we managed to get a small deal for some solo displays where I could stay co competitive, do some competition flying and uh, a few air shows and just have some time off. And in that time off, the doors that had always been open, but I didn't have time to have a look what's behind the door. Suddenly I had time to look. And the next thing is I started Warbird flying. I started Sorry. flying DC-8s. We were able then to go and, and say yes to an offer of taking our team to the Far East for a, a month, which then led to five years of business all over the Far East in China, Indonesia, Malaysia mostly. And so it was, it was amazing. That decision to take the sabbatical led to more diversity for me in my flying, but also just a complete break in terms of doing the same thing again and again. It's Scully, your favorite warbird? Unequivocally, the, uh, uh, the, the Spitfire. I mean, who wouldn't say that? You know, everybody aspires to getting to fly the Spitfire. And uh, I've only, I've flown four of the World War II fighters, the Sea Fury, the Mustang, the Yak-3, and the Spitfire. And I have to say, it's, uh, it's the Spitfire. And uh, like you, I flew the Spitfire with a song in my heart. It was just nothing, nothing to beat it. The way it maneuvers, looking out on that beautiful elliptical wing, knowing that you're in a spitty and that you can do almost anything you want to in the aeroplane. I, I just fell in love with that aeroplane. It's wonderful. I've been very lucky with the Spitfire. I've flown the 5, 8, 9, 11, and the 16. And uh, the most delightful is the 5. The 5 is very light. If you're not going high and you don't need the, the extra supercharging and the power, the light weight of the 5, it's just delightful. The, the balance, it's, it's very, very nice to fly. When did you get invited to fly for, for Red Bull? How it started was a friend of mine, Frank Verste, sent me a video. And it was unbelievable. It was a, a, a POV of him diving down to the river and going under the chain bridge in Budapest. It just blew my mind. And then into a racetrack. I thought, oh my goodness, this looks like to die for. Up till then, I had never flown under a bridge and I really really wanted to give it a go so I called him and I said hey listen I saw I saw what you guys are doing it's just amazing I have an airplane I'm available so if you're looking for more pilots I'd love to be involved they invited me to do the whole of 2005 but I had already committed with old flying machine company to the making of a first world war film so I couldn't do half the season but I did the second half of 2005 and then I was full-time from the beginning of 2006. So I did six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. Then the air race was shut down for a short time. That took three years. And then I did 14, 15, and 16. So a total of what, eight years? And, and what year did you win the, the, the world championships? I won in 2014 after a long journey in the doldrums developing the MX. In 2014, I got off to a reasonable start. And then what really, really made the difference was standardization. So that by the time that the race started again in 2014, it was a very level playing field. Everybody had the same engine, same power, and the weight had been taken care of. So lighter pilots had to carry some weight and that made the race so good. But I decided at the end of 15, that it was time to stop. And it was just quite interesting because at that stage, Red Bull were also getting rather anxious about the age of the pilots. I was becoming the oldest guy. What has been your life 
after Red Bull. We all know about the the the, the big accident here the, with the Hunter in 2015. Yes. And that changed the face of air shows here. And, the, and, and it was just going through, I hope it's changed now, but it was going through a very difficult period whereby there was a, a level of toxicity focused on the cockpit. If you've got somebody shouting at you on the radio all the time, you're too close, you're too high, you're too fast, you, you know what I mean? You can't really do a relaxed job. And I'd always, my whole life, I'd always been able to do my job in a relaxed way, you know? I didn't really want to end on a bad note, so I thought I'd retire. So I bought an RV7 and I just enjoy flying a pit special in an RV7 and flying for pleasure. Nigel, it's been fantastic talking to you. <laughs> Thanks for your time. I wish we could just sit here and carry on. And uh, hopefully the next time we talk, it's in your home or around your pond yeah. uh, in England. Guys, Thanks. so good to see you again. And thanks a lot for the time. Thank you, Nigel. Thank thanks, you, Nigel. Nigel. Yeah, thank love you. to Hillary. Yeah, and yeah, there's, we'll a Piper, there's a Piper Cub waiting for you in Paris. <laughs> <laughs>